There's several things that we want to uh, acknowledge today. Number one is that there are different levels in, uh, in, in teaching. Somebody shout levels. There are different levels in the teacher. In God, there are different levels in the teacher. Uh, Romans chapter, tell, uh, chapter number 12, verse number 6 tells us, we have different gifts according to the grace which is given unto us. Your gift, he says in Romans chapter 12, is prophecy. And he says, if it is prophecy, then prophesy according to the level of your faith. And then he says, if your level is service, then serve on that level. Then he says, if your level is teaching, then teach on that level. There are different levels in teaching. But there are also different levels in the uh, different levels in the in the audience, in the listener. There's levels in the teacher. There's levels in the in the listener or the audience. Corinthians chapter number two, verse number uh, thirteen says, uh, "And this we speak not in words taught to us by the wisdom of men, but in the words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual gifts." He says, "The natural man does not accept the things that come with." Uh, from, from the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Do you hear that he's saying that there are those who can't understand things that are of the Spirit? So uh, there's different levels in what you can teach. Paul says there's certain things that I can't teach you because you are babes. He says that I've got to give some milk and I've got to give some meat. So there's different levels within the audience. You remember Jesus says something like, cast not your pearls upon swine. He's not trying to be derogatory. He's talking about there's different levels in the audience. Do you get that? There's different levels in the teacher. There's different levels in the audience. But watch this. There's also different levels in righteousness. Let me show you some different levels in righteousness as I talk to you about the pursuit of uh, the pursuit of righteousness. There's different levels in righteousness. Follow me. Genesis chapter number 38, verse 25 and 26 says this. As she being brought out, Tamar sent the message to her father-in-law and said, I am with child. And uh, it goes on to say, and she added, please examine whose seal and whose cord and staff these are. Now, verse 26 says, Judah, recognizing the item, said, she is more righteous. And once you hear the word more and righteous, it suggests that there are levels of righteousness it says that she is more righteous than I and then he goes on to say since I did not give the son that she should have had and now watch this different levels in what in righteousness we know that there's levels in teachers we know that because there's bishops and there's apostles and the apostles were set for uh, the creation and the confirmation of doctrine. We know that there's different levels in listeners because there are those who are five years old who cannot understand the things that a 20-year-old, just naturally there's levels of listeners. But we didn't always know that there were levels in righteousness, and some of us would have been offended if somebody would suggest that there are levels in righteousness. But it is logical that there are levels in righteousness because there is something called growth. And if you are growing in grace, as the scripture tells us to do, then you are on a different level today than you were yesterday. There are levels in righteousness simply because there's levels in growth. Not only that, Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 20 says, For I say unto you that unless your righteousness surpasses or exceeds the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. No, hear what he said. Unless your righteousness exceeds or surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees. That's big. Because in their minds, the minds of his audience, the scribes were big and bad and amazing. When he talked to them about certain things, the disciples came back and said, who then can be saved? Because in the disciples' minds, the Pharisees were top notch. And here goes Jesus saying, except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees. He's talking about there are levels of righteousness. Is that good? 
Watch this, Proverbs chapter number 6 and verse number 16. He says, there are six things that God, the Lord hates. Seven that are detestable or abominations to him. Then he names them. That suggests that there are not only levels in sin, but there's also levels of righteousness. All right? If somebody is sitting in the place of abomination, those who are not are on a different level of righteousness. And I want to know, is there anybody who's not scared to grow? I want to know, is there anybody who is not intimidated by the Lord's ask of you? That he might ask you to turn off your phone. He might ask you to love your enemy. He may ask you to bless those who despitefully use you. The Lord may ask you to bless those who persecute you and to walk in peace. God is looking for some kind of soldier who is not intimidated by his ask. And you cannot get so comfortable in where you were last year that you are preparing for the grave rather than preparing for growth. We are not looking just to finish our life and grow to heaven. I want every adventure that God has for us. And in order to get those adventures, he is not just going to disseminate them on just anybody. There are levels in him. So you may be a disciple, but you may find yourself at the base of the mountain. But there is an opportunity for you to leave the base of the mountain and climb the mountain to go higher. Anybody want to go higher? To go higher in the Lord. Where on this level, you get to see Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus and having a conversation. That's a different level than those who are at the base of the mountain and can't cast out a demon are y'all here with me you don't want to be the kind that's at the base of the mountain that is grabbing the mic and shaking the mic and raising your voice and hollering and yelling but can't be effective when the rubber meets the road they're wheeled into the church and they're wheeled out the church Come in with a bad attitude, leave with a bad attitude. Come in on meth and crack and all kind of bondage and leave out with those same addictions. That is because you're at the base of the mountain and you're, you're not even equipped at the base of the mountain rather than climbing the levels. That's why you cannot listen to every naysayer. You got to be able to find out what level on the mountain you're on. What level on the mountain you on? I cannot listen to you tell me it don't take all of that because you're not committed on that particular level. You, you want to talk about how emotional my worship is. Well, I need you to consider the example of David who danced out of his clothes. I'm fully, at least I'm fully clothed while I'm leaping and jumping and praising God. Remember what the disciples said. The disciples talked about the woman with the uh, alabaster box. And they criticized her because they said this could have been given to the poor. It could have been sold for a lot and given to the poor. And Jesus comes to her aid and defends her. He says what she has done is she has prepared me for my death, for my burial. She has anointed. And the poor you have with you always. He didn't tell on them and say you're a thief and you just want it because you got your hand in the bag. He didn't expose them. He just protected her praise. And I need you to know that God is protecting your praise. And if you want to leap, you ought to leap. If you want to wave your hand, you can wave your hand. If you want to clap, you ought to clap and make it sound like thunder. The Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And in the Hebrew, if you're going to follow God correctly, in the Hebrew, that means that I want you to make a ear busting noise I want you to raise your voice and let God hear you 
I want you to stand on your feet. I want you to run. I want you to acknowledge his mercy and his goodness toward you. I don't want to have to beg or prime or I don't want to have to do these props. I don't want to have to act like him. I don't want to have to change my voice and use my shenanigans or my antics. I want you to put your maturity on display. I want you to realize that he brought you from a mighty long way. He put food on your table. He kept you in your right mind. I got a reason and a right to worship God. Somebody shout hallelujah and give God praise even if you're tired. Give God praise even if you're lethargic. Give God praise if you're hungry and ready to go. Give God praise if you don't feel like it. Give God praise while you're sitting at home on your couch. Give God praise even if you sinned last night, had a blunt this morning. Give God praise because he's worthy. He's high and lifted up. Make them talk about you. Make them say it don't take all that. Make them say I can't believe what she is doing. She has let down her hair. Let down your hair and give God some glory until your neighbor can smell your worship and it fills the atmosphere. Fill the atmosphere with the fragrance of praise. Fill the atmosphere with the fragrance of worship. Reenact this woman's worship. Are y'all here with me? Hallelujah. And the Old Testament tried to intimidate them. The Old Testament kings, they said, don't you believe those prophets? Your Lord can't save you. Don't you believe your, those prophets? Your, where's your Lord? He cannot save you. Before I take it back, I'll add thereunto. I will lift him and trust him because he's worthy. Yeah. And I need you to put it on display because there are those who are turning back from God. And your worship can show them Yes. Look at the cancer dried up. I just got a report recently. I, I said, I said, how is so and so doing? The person got super excited. They said, Oh, God has performed a miracle. They kept going on and on and on. They didn't expect me to remember. They probably didn't even think that I was going to pray. Y'all know how people do pray for me. And you say, God bless them and get in your car, and that's the extent of it. Yeah, they said they got cancer and they asked me to pray. I said, oh, come on here. Yeah, let's pray. I asked, I said, how they do it? They said, oh, God has performed a miracle. Not the doctors. Praise God for the doctors. But everything doesn't come from the doctors. God is still in the miracle working business. And before you listen to anybody who say he ain't, Elevate your worship and your praise. Because you don't know what level they're on. And degrees don't mean you at the top of the mountain. And going to a church that sounds more like Charles Stanley than it does Gene Lindsay does not mean that you are on a higher level. I could be in a storefront church with a washboard and a broken tambourine. But when it comes to my relationship with God. My degrees don't matter when it comes to lifting him up and giving him some praise. And this isn't a show. It's not emotional. You don't know what God has done for me. Hey. You don't know. You don't know. Can I give you a secret? Don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. If it contradicts scripture, don't listen to them. If it lowers Christology, don't listen to them. If it relegates God to being weak, don't listen to them. Add to it. And don't y'all be standing in this church nodding your head. Oh, that's good because I raised my voice. I was preaching when I was calm. Yeah. And don't you dare think 
that, that, be, that all you have to do is just stand and say, preach. No, you got to take this home with you so that God can get into your daily agenda. Yeah. After we leave here, you're going to cut off the TV. After we leave here, are you going to fast? After we leave here, are you going to clap your hands? Take a tambourine home and bring it back next week and shake it in the bathroom. Shake it in the laundry room. Shake but don't you do all your praise in here. What we do here is we connect your faith with your faith because one can put 1,000 to flight and two can put 10,000 to flight. What we do is we get exponentially savvy and we do greater things together in here. But when we go home, we turn up the heat there too. We turn up the heat there. We turn up the heat there. Because when you worship God, when you lift God, you don't even know it, but you're pushing back distractions. Yeah, remember what he said? He said, pray least you enter into temptation. Y'all get it? So when you are praying, you don't know it, but you are warding off certain temptations. Pray, least you enter into temptation. You ought to bless him until the devil can't even get in the room. You ought to thank him until the devil got to come and say, have you tried them? Yeah, I tried them, but there's a hedge of protection. I can't touch them because there's a... I can look, but I can't touch. He can look, but he can't touch. Who is that a word for? He can look, but he can't touch. Because you took some stuff home with you and you said, not here, devil. Are y'all getting it? I don't see y'all taking notes. Are y'all getting it? There's levels of righteousness. Remember in the Old Testament where they go out into the, into the, waters and it like comes up to their ankle and then they go a little bit further and it like comes up to their knee and then they go a little bit further and it comes out to like their waist they are going out into the deep Woo! And, and that's what the lord is asking of of the believers nowadays don't be shallow don't just stand at, at the banks of relationship with God. When you're on the banks of relationship, you're too close to the enemy. Launch out into the deep. Yes. And that's going to require commitment. Jesus got on the boat and he pushed out from the shore and talked to the people. Peter was in the boat. Jesus spoke to him and said, come. Launch out into deeper waters. Go deeper in God. See what's out there. See what he has for you. You can't want a house more than you want the God of the house. You can't be so committed to a car that you will employ every spiritual principle there is to get his material stuff. Woo! How many want more of him? Oh, I don't believe y'all. I don't believe y'all. I don't believe y'all. I say, how many want more of him? Growth signifies levels. Second Peter chapter number three, verse number 13 says, but grow in grace, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You hear it? But grow in grace.
grow in grace. And when you grow in grace, what he's going to do is challenge your thinking. Yeah. He's going to say, yeah, that's fine if you want to live naturally. But spiritually, I have to change how you think. Brother Lever talked a couple weeks ago just beautifully about several sanctifications. Sanctification of your body, sanctification of the spirit, sanctification of the mind. God is going to challenge your thinking so that you can think spiritual thoughts. If you get upset easily, the other day I was upset. I'm in school. I'm getting my doctorate degree, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. I'm in school. I'm getting my doctorate degree. I got two A's so far. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. Y'all done made me forget what I was about to say. I was, I, I got upset. I mean, I was ferocious. And, and I'm being transparent here. What the Lord is working with me on is to let stuff go quickly. Now, now that's, that's big. Now, maybe that's not you. Maybe you're good. Maybe you're too good at letting stuff go. Woo! Maybe God wants you to care a little bit more. But for me, he says, you hold that too much. The other day I woke up, I had a crook in my neck all day. And I said to my wife, I said, I said, it's not the crook that I'm concerned about. It's the fact that I'm not carrying stress right. I recognize this was not carrying stress right. You see that? For somebody else, not carrying stress right turns into heart palpitation, turns into high blood pressure. For somebody else, it turns into a stroke. For somebody else, it turns into cancer. For somebody else, it turns into your hair falling out. For somebody else, it turns into you can't sleep. For somebody else, it turns into you, you are in the refrigerator later than you should be. I got to preach it that way because y'all just looking at me like a crook in your neck. All right. God wants you to carry your stress right. How do you carry it right? Cast all your cares. All of them. On me because I care for you. So I had a crook in my neck because I was upset about some stuff. And then we was on our way to the grocery store somewhere. And I said to myself, I said to my wife, I said, wait a minute. Two things. I said, one, I haven't prayed about this. And two, it hasn't happened yet. Why am I upset about something that I haven't even offered to God. Now some of y'all upset about stuff that you did offer to God. Now you prayed about it and God has said, I thought you prayed about it. Let me handle it. Why are you saying this? I'm just talking about him growing you. I'm just talking about him growing you. I'm just talking about him growing us. And you have to be able to examine yourself and to see where you need the tweaking. Because yeah. some of your mouth is telling on you that you don't believe God in this area. So I need a tweak. I need a check. I need a correction. So that I can believe God even more. I can Grow in grace. Can I tell y'all that by the time I got home, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. By the time I got home, maybe about an hour later, the situation was resolved. Do y'all hear me? You were up, I mean, I was ferociously upset. And an hour later... It was finished. It was fixed when I was up. When I was upset about it. Does your Bible not say all things work together? 
desire for good to them who love God? Do you qualify or not? Do you love him or not? If you love him, it's all good, baby. Problems are just illusions for the believer. I can't believe you said that. Psychologically, you can't tell people that, Pat. You can't tell them that their problem is not real. I'm not saying the problem is not real. I'm saying it's an illusion. Yes. Yeah. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow. You're making it bigger than it really, it, and God wants you to grow. Can I give you three, three ways? Number one, let me pull out my teacher pedagogy. We have something called, in education, maybe you've heard it, we have a, a I do, a, a we do, and a you do. And I do, a we do, and a you do. I'm talking about growth. I do, we do, you do. Y'all know it. You've, you've had it. You go to class. Teacher introduce something new. He goes to the board. She goes to the board. She writes the objective. She gives a hook. He gives you the lesson. It is the teacher telling you how to do it. And the teacher models it and shows you how it's done. That is the I do. Who's doing it? I'm doing it. Why? Because you don't know how. So I do it to show you how to do it. So when Jesus says love your neighbors, here he is in John chapter 1. And the scripture says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and all things were made by him and was not anything made that was made but by him. In him was life and the light and the darkness and John was not this light but he was sent to bear witness of the light. Y'all know the scripture. And the word became flesh. And dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the, he, it is him doing the I do. Let me show you how this is done. He is our example. Okay. I do. Somebody say I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. I want, well, what are you saying? Forgive. When you going to show me? Up on the cross of Calvary, 20 miles outside of Jerusalem, I'm going to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I'm going to do it with a crown of thorns pressed into my head. I'm going to do it after they have plucked out my beard with their fist. I'm going to do it when they have put a nine-inch spike through my radius corpus bone. I'm going to do it when they have taken a, a, a spear and stuck it into my side and serial sandwich fluid is going to come out my side. I am going to say, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. As what? And I do. Y'all see? I do. I show you, God says, how you're supposed to live. And notice that Jesus is not cussing people out on Facebook Live. And notice that Jesus is not asking people to send him money for a jet. I can't get no help here. And notice that Jesus is not molesting and raping and then covering up and using insurance to pay people off. And if Jesus ain't doing it, then maybe you should avoid it. And notice Jesus goes to church. The Bible says, and he went to the temple as was his custom. So if Jesus is doing it, maybe you ought to follow suit. If he playing clubs, maybe you ought to play some cousins clubs and stop reneging. Follow suit. 
Are y'all here with me? Because this is the I do. There are some things that God does for you. I got to get out of here. There's some things that God does for you. He does it. Come on. Corinthians chapter number five says God made Christ to be sin even though he was without sin so that believers would, watch this, become the righteousness of God. That is a God did that for you, Brother Steve. Your righteousness doesn't come from you, Lady Tarita. This is a God do. He became sin who knew no sin so that you would become the righteousness of God. Righteousness is a gift that is granted to the believer. That's so big. That's so big. And by the way, that's where you ought to be leaping and praise. Oh my goodness. I, I'm, that is a gift that he gave. Now the beautiful thing about it is you don't find God often pulling back a gift. He gave it to you when he knew you was going to go to the hotel room. He knew it when he knew you was going to go to the club. And he knew you was going to be He knew you weren't going to do everything right. And he still gave you his righteousness. And then says, now grow in this. He knew Adam and Eve was going to mess up in the garden. He knew when he gave the disciples the Holy Ghost uh, to, you know, power to cast out demons that they was going to mess it up. You remember? Should we call down fire on them? Send her away for she crieth after her. He knew. He knows that when he gives gifts, everybody's not going to appreciate it. And there's going to be some exploitation. He knew that when Noah got on the ark, that when he got off the ark, y'all ain't with me here. Y'all know your Bible. He was going to act up when he got off the boat. We're not promoting sin. We're lifting the omniscience of God who knows that when I give you righteousness, now you got to grow in it. Somebody say hallelujah. 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 I got some stuff for my kids that they got to grow into. As far as I'm concerned, it's theirs. It's theirs right now. But they got to grow into what I'm giving them. Are you here with me? Lay your hands on your chest and say, okay, now grow in it. Yeah, God does the giving and the granting of righteousness. That's what God does. You can't do it. You can't give yourself righteousness. That's a God do. And then not only does God do it, he teaches you how to walk in it. Yes. That's the God do. Let's move to the, the we do. The we do is when there are things that you and God do together. So the teacher says, all right now, class, I'm going to do problem number eight. Because I did one through seven myself. I'm going to do... We're going to do problems 8 through 12, what, 2? We're going to do it together. All right, now what do I do next? You subtract the 1 and get it. Good, Bobby. All right, now Daquan, what do I do next? All right, fantastic, great, Daquan. Sh Shania, come on, finish it out. What do I do? I'm doing these names on purpose. What do I do Next, Shania. Fantastic, Shania. That's right. Now let's go to the next one. And we're going to do these together. And that's how your righteousness works. 
You couldn't die on the cross. He did that as a God do or I do by himself. Now there's some things that we got to do together. And that is when God calls you, you now have to respond to him. And we are going to do this together. So Jesus walked on the water by himself. Then he calls Peter out on the water with him. And they are walking on the water too. You see that? And this is how it works. Some of you are in the God do phase. And others of us are in the we do phase. Where God wants you to respond. Watch this. He says, for we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ to do good works. Which God prepared in advance as our way of life. You see the God do? But watch this. Therefore remember. Whenever God does something, you have a response. And that is a response that he helps you to do. Remember this? God gives unto every man a measure of faith so that you can respond to him by faith. You are in partnership with God. So he says, remember that the former you who are Gentiles in the flesh and called uncircumcision by the circumcision that is done in the body by hands. Partnership. Going on from here, we saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and the sons of John. Jesus called them. Watch this. And immediately they left their boats and followed, the father, followed him. You hear that? You're working in tandem. As synchronized swimmers, we're in this together I can go on but how many got you're doing it together the tragedy is when you try to start living righteous on your own Mm -mm. we're going to do this together all right God I need you because this is hard for me all right Lord I need you because I really don't want to let this go All right, God, I need you because this is a craving. All right, now, Lord, I need you because I've been to church. I want to try this thing. But three days in, here comes that, that itch, that flesh itch, that flesh drive. So I need you to work with. Take up your cross and follow me. Right? We're going to do this together. Remember Jesus is carrying his cross? And then here comes Simon, the Cyrene, to do what? Carry the cross. To? Yes. Yeah. Remember? Make the men sit down. Poyo in Greek. Make the men sit down. And then Jesus took the bread. He broke he blessed it he gives it to his disciples and then they disperse it they are working to together and god doesn't want you to do this on your own he wants you to work with him if there's things that you can't do you feel it's too hard it's too tough you can't afford it that means you probably are not supposed to do it on your own That means you need to send God a prayer invitation. If it's baking bread, if it's washing clothes, if it's raising kids, if it's being a good husband or a better wife, if you are struggling, that's because you shouldn't do it alone. Invite God to come in and help you do it with him. If it is living righteous, and you can't get, seem to get free from stuff. But one of the issues is you're already free. The second issue is now you have to grow into it. And you need to invite him in to your growth. Help me. He says, I will send you another comforter. 
That's the paracletus. That's helper. To walk alongside with you. That's what it means, a paracletus. To walk alongside with you. I do. We do. You do. And that's where some of you are. And that's why you feel upset. The we do is when God's presence is so strong in your life, you at the grocery store and can feel him. The you do, he's still there. He's still there. Remember, Jesus was with his disciples. He says, I am with you, but I shall be in you. You see that? So some of you feel like God is not there. And it's just that he is there in a different way. Now you're in the you do phase. Where I have taught you disciples. And now I want you to go out and do the works where I said greater works shall you do. Because I go to the Father. You can't do these works on your own. It will feel like it. You may not look to your left and see me like you used to. But I am there in a different form. It's just a you do. When the teacher asks the kids now to do the assignment by themselves, she don't go to the office or go on summer vacation. She's in the room. He's at the desk. He's still working. He's just at the desk. He's at the desk working and they're at their seat working. Yes. Sometimes when I ask the students to do it, I'm on observation. I got my clipboard and I'm walking around and I'm observing to see how they're doing. It's just that we're in a different part of the lesson. It's not that I'm not there. It's that I want to observe to see if you're going to listen to Facebook or you're going to listen to me. I just want to see if you're going to listen to your favorite preacher or are you going to listen to the word of God. I am there. It's just a you do time. Somebody say you do it. When he says work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling, he is not asking you to build your own righteousness. He is asking you to employ the fruit of the spirit, the benefits, the Matthew chapter number five, the beatitudes. I want you to do some stuff. And I'll just observe to see how you do it. And if I need to chime in, I'll chime in. If I need to correct you, I'll go ahead and correct you. But I want to see how you've grown. I do. We do. You do. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the pursuit of righteousness and for teaching us the levels and the stages of righteousness. And I pray, God, that you keep us as we grow in you. In Jesus' name. Amen.